What's up, Undisputed listeners? It's your boy, Shay Sharp. I wanted to tell you about my new podcast, Club Shay Shay, where we always do something before two something. Each week, I sit down with a guest for a drink and conversation, and as host and proprietor of Club Shay Shay, I welcome in esteemed guests such as Snoop Dogg, Floyd Money Mayweather, LeVar Ball, Isaiah Thomas, just to mention a few. Whether I'm talking to an athlete, a musician, an actor, or a lifelong friend, Club Shay Shay is a place where people share inspiring and motivational stories about their journeys to prominence. The new episode drops every Monday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to Club Shay Shay now and make sure you never miss a new episode. Now back to Undisputed. Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Taft. This podcast is the full show from today's episode of Undisputed from start to finish. They've got a busy slate, so skip Shannon. Let's get to it. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp. Good morning, guys. How we doing? Good morning, good morning. Skip, I thought we were gonna pull it out last night. We were gonna talk about it, but I thought we had it. Old goat had that <laughs> jumper floating, driving to the basket. I said, we got him. We got him. We don't okay. got him. <laughs> Just be- be- before you jump on me and ridicule me, I'm the first to say pandemic P was added again last night in Boston. <laughs> Paul George was George yeah. Paul last night in Boston. He went one for nine in the fourth quarter without oh. Kawhi and 0 for five from three. And now pandemic P in his last four fourth quarters is a combined three of 22 and one for 13 from three. <laughs> so he's actually trying to do his best LeBron impression over the last four fourth quarters. Way to go, Paul. But, 13? Skip, but I thought he said, you know, he heard all that talk, all that talk last year that rubbed him the wrong way. I thought so, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's oh, I thought me so the wrong as well, but that right was now. a long, long time ago. Uh, so we're going to talk about <laughs> that guy. We're also going to talk about what did and ha- didn't happen for the Lakers and LeBron. But today we begin by the latest in Dallas. And listen up, guys. There's good news and bad news coming out of the DAC contract talks, according to NFL Network's Jane Slater. The good news, the negotiations between the team and Prescott have been more productive as of late. Bad news for Cowboys fans? Well, apparently Dak wants to be paid, quote, right behind Patrick Mahomes, who signed a 10-year, $500 million extension last summer. And while Dallas feels their offer is, quote, respectable, they're clearly not in that ballpark yet. So, Shannon, how will this news impact the public perception of this stalemate right now? Skip, you and I talked about this on Monday, how both sides have done a great job of saying we don't really know exactly what Dak wants. We know he wants to be somewhere around 40, but we're not really sure. Now we're really sure. Now I can assure you, Dak Prescott and his side, Todd France, have not told anyone the exact numbers Dak is looking for. So I feel very, with a very high degree of certainty, this came from the other side. And again, Dak was winning the PR battle skip because he's made relatively quiet. It's been people like yourself and I and on other networks that's talking about Dak should get paid. This is what Dak's worth. But Dak in his camp hasn't said anything. And then all of a sudden, boom, Dak wants somewhere between 43 and 44 million dollars. Skip, what the Cowboys must understand is that Deshaun Watson, all these other quarterbacks, Jared Goff, Carson Wentz, Skip, they signed these deals with four years left. They had the fourth year, the fifth year option, and two franchise tags. So theoretically, even Patrick Mahomes had four years before he could ever get to the market. So the question is, if Patrick Mahomes was in Dak Prescott's situation currently, Skip, what would that, what would our Patrick Mahomes be worth if he was in the exact same situation as, as, as Dak Prescott? 60 million, 63, 65. Well, Dak is saying those guys gave their team discounts relative because they were under contract for four more years and they took long-term security. I'm not under contract. I fulfilled it. Not only did I play the contract out in its totality, I played another year on the franchise tag. So, Skip, if the franchise tag is 38 million, how do you expect the guy to take a four or five year deal? for 36 to 37 million. You know that's not gonna happen. So you gotta stop looking at it and say, well, 
Dak is not a top five quarterback. And he's not this. Skip, Jerry Goff was making that one point more than Aaron Rodgers. So was Carson Wentz. It's called the market. And when you sign, you look at when, when J.J. Watt signed, we thought that was a huge number. And then all of a sudden, there were 10 guys on the defense side of the football that was making more than J.J. Watt. The agents are not going to allow these teams to try to suppress the market. That's the team. That's what teams try to do. I don't blame them. I'm trying to keep costs down, Skip, while earning maximum profit on the back end. The players and their representatives said, no, we're going to keep this ball moving. We're going to keep it rolling. So I don't know if he's going to get $43, $44 million, Skip, but I feel very comfortable as I sit here today. Dak Prescott's going to get $40-plus million. It might be $40 million and a dollar. It might be $40 million and $100,000. But Dak Prescott is going to get more than $40 million annually if if he signs a long-term deal with the Cowboys. I believe he plays up under the franchise tag, and I believe he hits the road next year to get the payday that he deserves. Okay. Back to Jenny's question. How will this, what I consider breaking news, impact the public perception of this stalemate between Dak Prescott and Jerry Jones. We spoke about it yesterday and we said we're shooting in the dark (laughs) because nobody knows a figure. Nobody has anything to shoot at that Dak wants X. We never knew for, for a year and, gee, like a year and a half, we haven't had anything to shoot at. But I have been telling you for a good year and a half that he does want something up in the Patrick Mahomes echelon, something as Jane Slater, NFL Network reported, something close to Patrick Mahomes' money. I don't know exactly the dollar figure, but I think it's well north of 40. I think he wants four years that would average something just beneath Patrick Mahomes' 45. So maybe four years that would average $44 million. It's a ton of money, and it's going to dramatically impact, I believe, Cowboy Nation's perception of this. I don't know how many people outside Cowboy Nation really care about how much Dak Prescott makes, but obviously I'm a lifelong, true blue, dyed in the wool, the the metallic blue wool, Dallas Cowboy fanatic, and this hurts my heart. Because now I know pretty much for sure, because I do trust Jane Slater and her reporting, and you're probably right, Shannon, it probably came from the Jerry Stephen Jones side of this, because we're we're getting toward a D-Day here. We're, We're getting toward another moment of fish or cut bait. Are you going to tag him again at $37.7 million or try to get a deal done? And obviously the situation is now desperate enough that one side has finally leaked some, some uh, at least idea of what Dak is demanding. Some and it's something figure. close to Patrick yeah. Mahomes. Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some, some dollar figure, Skip. And the thing is, is that when I look at this, Skip, I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, you had a whole year to try to be working on this behind the scenes. Skip, obviously Dak could not sign a long-term deal because once the July, I think it's July 15th deadline had passed, you're unobligated under the, uh, the play up under the franchise tag. But Skip, you can be working behind the scenes thinking like, okay guys, the first opportunity we get, what's a number? Give me a number. Let's start working on something, building towards something that when free agency starts and next year, the next league year, is we're ready to go, we can have this thing ironed out Dot a I here, cross a T there, a little language here or there. But Skip, it's almost like we're starting from scratch again. It's like, uh, okay, Dak, w- what do you want? Well, you know where Dak wants. Skip, he's not going to play for the average of the franchise tag. The franchise tag is roughly $38 million. You're going to have to exceed that in a long-term deal by at least 2 to $3 million. So $40, $41 million. I don't believe Dak turns down a, a four-year, $165 million deal with about 100 with, with At the time of signing, he gets $90 million. I don't believe Dak turns that down, but I also don't believe Dak is going to give them a discount because let me tell you what Dak has seen, Skip. Dak has seen, since he signed with the Cowboys, he's seen that offensive line get maximum value. 
He saw uh, Zeke Elliott get maximum value. He saw Amari Cooper. He saw Jalen Smith. He saw D. Long. He's he's everyone has got their market value except J except Dak. And Dak says, "Hold on, you're not going to market correct my paycheck because maybe some of those guys didn't fulfill the obligation that you thought. I'm going to get mine." So this is where we are, Skip, and I do believe, and, and to Jenny's original point, maybe some of the fans, like that, you, that's being greedy. Skip, let me tell you what I did. Skip, when our contract came up, and I had really not made any money. My first, my first contract, I made 63000 and next year I made seventy three, And then I signed in, then I got a new deal for two twenty five. went to the Pro Bowl, and they had offered me leading up until the last year because I only signed two-year two -year deals. So, Skip, the next year I was going to make three twenty-five. dollars Well, they came to me and said, we'll give you $500,000. Skip, I'm ready to take it. Skip, I never $500,000. dollars they going to give me that? Man, just said, hold on, wait a minute, Shannon. What are you talking about? We're not taking $500,000. We're going to get millions of dollars. And that's what Dak is saying, Skip. To the average person, and I was the average person, even though I was in the NFL, Skip, $500,000 and a half a million, I could have never fathom making that kind of money. So I understand the general population saying, man, 30 million, 35, 38, 40, that, really? Okay. But you can't look at it. You have to look at it through the lens of a professional athlete. Okay. I'm just looking at it as a Dallas Cowboy fan, and I'm going to say what I've been <laughs> saying for a year and a half. I have been ahead of this curve. I have been right about this for a year and a half. Dak has overplayed his hand. The new agent, Todd France, way overplayed his hand. I've been telling you that from sources close to this deal from the start. I love Dak Prescott. I loved him from the start, but I love my Dallas Cowboys more. And I am disappointed in the way Dak has played this. And I believe starting today, many Dallas Cowboy fans will sit back and say, you know what? That's just too much money. Because if you're gonna pay Dak Prescott an average of 43, 44 million over the next four years, you better go win at least one Super Bowl. At least one. Mm -hmm. And Shannon, the more you overpay Dak Prescott, the less your chances are of winning a Super Bowl because it's gonna make it nearly impossible to improve a team that, that on defense was awful last year. If, even if you have to because commit to Dak for just the tag positions. this year, let me finish, let me finish. Even if you have to commit to Dak for just okay. the tag, $38 million this year, it's so much, that's 21% of your salary cap this year. It's outrageously high. Mm -hmm. Dak cost the, the, or counted the most percentage of any team's cap last year at $31.4 million. Yeah. It makes it virtually impossible to improve the defensive side of the ball. And in the end, a quarterback that I've always compared to Tom Brady in that I've always said Dak is Brady-esque. He can pick you to pieces. He doesn't have the biggest cannon of an arm, but he has a good arm, and he's accurate, and, and he's smart, and he can dink and dack you, if that's what you want to say, to death, because he can throw it deep also. But in the end, he's Brady-esque on the field, but not at the bargaining table because Tom Brady has always taken far less than market value. Even you See, admitted that the offer from Jerry Jones a year ago was 35 or $36 million. It was great. It yes. was fair, said Shannon Sharp. It was more than fair, yes. said me. Yes. Yes. And yet now it, he's so dug in, the blood is so bad between him and Jerry Jones that this is going nowhere. There is no way Jerry is going to pay him close to Patrick Mahomes money because Jerry just saw what happened to Jared Goff. He just saw what happened to Carson Wentz. And I don't want to hear all your stuff about, yeah, but they were ahead of the time. You know, they got their deals ahead of time. I don't care. That's the way now it works. Is yeah. Now is now. Now is now. And I, I as a Cowboy okay, fan, I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. Because if you, if you don't sign him, if you just play under a tag, you're crippled against the cap. If you lose Dak Prescott, I don't know where you turn for your next quarterback. 
I love Dak, but I think he's like the 10th the, the best quarterback in pro football. I don't think he's the second best. And I don't care what the market so dictates. Me- I, I don't care. Look, Ernestine and I go look at houses in Los Angeles and we say, that's a $10 million house. Well, we don't buy it. We just think it's yeah. incredibly overpriced. Well, Dak is overpriced. Well, you're not going to get it. And, and I would say good luck to any other team if they're going to give him $44 million a year. He can't live up to it because he's not that guy. And I'm going to say it one more time. In his last 17 starts, he is 6-11. and 11. And in the last 13 games of two seasons ago, obviously when he was healthy, he disappointed me again and again and again. Do I need to recite the litany of at New no. Orleans and then at Chicago and at New England and at Philadelphia and at, Buffalo at home yeah, and, yeah. and even this year, Cleveland yeah. at home and at Seattle. He's New had England, a lot yeah. of bad to blow uh, average Minnesota. games. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I can't defend it anymore. He is asking way out of bounds money. And I hope Cowboy fans now see it. And I hope the pendulum of support now swings back toward a Jerry Jones, who's the biggest, easiest target in sports. But I don't want to hear any more from anybody. Pay the man. Just pay him. And I kept saying, pay Pay him what? $45 million? It's absurd (laughs) kind of money. It will cripple my team (laughs) against the cap for the next four years. And yes, I am now officially disappointed with my man, Dak Prescott. Skip Bayless, the house that you and Ernestine went and looked at recently for $10 million, had you purchased it when you first got out here, you could have got it for six. But because you thought the market was going to correct itself, and it it seemed too high at the time, because that's the same thing. I'm looking at houses myself, Skip, and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Oh, whoo. But if I had purchased it when I first moved out here, I'd have been sitting free and clear. So Dak is looking at Jerry and says, hold on. You said, okay, these guys, they made a decision with Carson Wentz, and they made a a bad decision with uh, 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 Jerry Goff. So are other teams looking at you said, you made a bad decision with Amari Cooper. You made a bad decision with with D-Law. You made a bad decision with uh, Jalen Smith. Look at your offensive line. You paid them top notch. One retired because of health issues. Zach Martin has been getting nicked and nicked and nicked. Yeah. And the last time Tyron Smith played a full season without missing any games. So Dak Prescott says, I'm not going to let you correct your mistakes on me when you fulfilled your obligation and paid them top dollar. That, what Dak cannot do is allow public sentiment, although they might be boo and Dak's not worth this, that, not worth that. He need to get some noise-canceling headphones so he can cut out the noise because that's not what he needs to hear. And he's not listening to it, even if he can hear it. Dak Prescott, and I told you this, Skip, the price will continuously go up. Dak Prescott, if the Cowboys give him a long-term deal, it is going to be north of $40 million. I told you that, Skip. The days of getting Dak Prescott for 33 the $38 million, those days are long past. The moment Deshaun Watson got $39 million with four years left on his contract, it was nothing more for that. That I mean, um, excuse me, Deshaun Watson got 111 guaranteed, 156 over four years, with four years left, 39 million annually. Dak Prescott wasn't going to go less than 40 because he has no years left. He played the contract out in its entirety, and he played a year on the franchise tag. So if you want Dak Prescott to be your quarterback for the very foreseeable future. It's going to take you 40 to north of $40 million to get it done. Okay. You just used the operative word in referring to Carson Wentz's contract that he got early from Philadelphia. They made a bad decision. Well, you've heard the old saying about throwing good money after bad money. Well, yes, Jerry Jones has made a bunch of bad decisions on players who cost a lot less than Dak Prescott, starting with, obviously, Ezekiel Elliott, who has never lived up to being the top-paid running back at $15 right. million a year, going to Demarcus Lawrence, going down to Zach Martin, who can't stay healthy, going to Tyron Smith, who can't stay healthy, and Jalen Smith, and we, we can just go, Amari, Amari at $21 million. He can't live up to that. Well, now, if you go to the top position and and you overpay Dak Prescott, you're throwing good money after all that bad money. It's a recipe for absolute disaster. Nobody's going to be able to live up to their contract. 
The only person who will be happy will be Shannon Sharp, who hates the Dallas Cowboys and wants to see them wrecked under the cap by <laughs> Dak Prescott's mega I deal won't. at $44 million a year. I just, I, I, I don't want to see it. Prescott I'm sorry. Get, I want Dak Prescott to get fair compensation. But what you're doing, Skip, is that you're bleeding on Dak Prescott because he, but, because he, but he didn't cut you. It was Ezekiel Elliott. It was Amari Cooper. It was D-Law. It was Jalen Smith. It was all those offensive linemen that are starting to get old that can't fulfill the obligation that cut you. But Jerry is bleeding on Dak, and Dak has done nothing. Dak hasn't. First of all, you ought to pay Dak for the simple fact you was paying him five hundred thousand a million dollars, and he was going thirteen and three and taking and winning divisions. So that should you should back pay. So Dak should take him to court and get back pay because y'all withheld his salary. Skip, he's not going to give you the discount. Wentz and Golf, Skip, they were one and two in the draft. They got toward, somewhere between twenty five and thirty million fully guaranteed. That was that was signing bonus. Plus what they got over the, the, the five year, the, the, the fifth year option. So they were willing to say, you know what? We'll take a little less money because we're so far away from free agency. But all the Cowboys had to do was go to Dak before they went to Wentz and golf, offer him 33 to 35 million. It's hard to see a scenario when Dak, tur Dak turns that down when he's making 1.5 to 2. But after you let Wentz and golf sign, with four years left, and they're getting 33-34, Dak is not going to take a comparable deal because his contract is up. You're not giving him financial security like they gave those guys. So Dak was unwilling to do a deal. But I told you, I tell you this, you said, okay, you believe he wanted that. But I'm telling you this, if you, believe, if you think Dak Prescott is going to si sign a long-term deal with the Dallas Cowboys for less than $40 million, Skip, you out your mind. OK, well, then I'm out of a quarterback because I still say <laughs> it, it counts that Dak Prescott is the quarterback, the face of the franchise of America's team. And by last count, he had around a dozen TV commercials, many of them national TV commercials. And he's making a lot of off field money that should count in the big picture of, of your compensation package because you happen to be the quarterback of that team in that town. You know what? I wish the fans would say Dak is being greedy like they say Jerry Jones that when he owned this, ga this gas company and they jacked the prices up when that storm hit and Jerry Jones made an extra billion dollars. I, wh why didn't Jerry Jones say, you know what? I've made so much money. The people of Dallas have been great to me. You know what, guys? Until this thing is worked out, free bill, free gas, free lights on me. That's not what he did. They jacked the price up. He made money over fifth. Basically, he priced gouged. And nobody said a word. But oh, now I think a whole Prescott. lot about it. I think it was oh, trending Prescott. on Twitter. That's how many people said a word about that. That's an apple hey, to an do? orange that has absolutely nothing exactly. to do with Dak Prescott's salary. Exactly. Zero. Exactly. Yeah. With that. When Dak says, I want, Dak says, I don't like apples or oranges. I want tangerines and honeydew. 40 yeah. plus million or I'm not your quarterback. Okay, I want all those good cowboy fans out there to, to <laughs> absorb these last numbers that I'm going to give you. If Dak just plays under the tag this coming year, he's going to represent 21% of your salary cap. That's one fifth of your cap. And also counting against yeah. the cap are the next six other players on the team who total 55% of the cap. All those guys we just talked about who were overpaid, that's only six yeah. other players. So seven total players next year will count 76% of the cap. Uh, that's seven players. And remember, you need 22 to play pro football, 22 starters, and you need you these guys called special teamers, and you need this guy called a kicker, and you need another one called a punter. And what, what you have here Skip. is a recipe for eight and eight disaster, or maybe worse, maybe six and 10 disaster. Skip. That's what you're talking about here, you and I want you. everybody to know Shannon Sharp is rooting, pushing, pulling for <laughs> Dak Prescott to hold on and dig in and wreck the Dallas Cowboys. That's what's happening here. Yeah, but you, but you and Jerry and everybody keeps telling me that Jerry is a businessman. How could he will allow, let it come down, that you need a 53-man roster and you would let seven guys count 70% of your roster. How would he do that? 
What businessman would you know that would allow that to happen? Well, Jerry Jones, uh, there's there's the businessman, and he is all-time great. And then there's the runner of a pro football team, the owner and operator of a pro football team. And the last ten time the his business. team got to the NFC Championship game was following the 1995 season. I wrote a book about it. So I don't think he's exactly qualified as all-time great as the, the operator of a football team. Well, Skip, the thing is, and then back then in the early 90s, you know this, free agency was in its early stages. And you know they started losing guys. They started losing the Godfrey Miles. They started losing the Alvin Harpers. They start, teams started coming in and stealing their players. And so what the Cowboys are going to have to do, Skip, is that they're going to have to make a decision. Either you franchise it and Dak walks after the season, or you're going to have to bite the bullet. It's like, Skip, back in the old days when they didn't have anesthesia, they give you a rag, they pull a little, give you a little swig of alcohol to drink, and they say, back down on the towel, because it's going to hurt a bit. Skip, it's going to hurt a bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, 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 uh, Dak, Dak Prescott doing surgery with no Novocaine, no morphine. Yeah. Oh, it's going to hurt I a bit. Well, back like down on the towel. Congratulations, yeah. Shannon. I, I am doing I like it. <laughs> no mercy. Hey, Undisputed listeners, I wanted to tell you about our brand new Fox Sports app and website, foxsports.com. Reimagine for the modern sports fan. Go ahead, download the new app right now. You don't even have to pause this episode. Every day on the new app and website, you'll see the top stories in sports, plus a rich world of written content, videos, social media, and analytics to give you a 360-degree view of the most important stories of the day. Streaming live TV has never been so easy or elegant. Every Fox Sports game, including all pregame and postgame shows, are just one click away. For the extra invested fan, we also go deep with real-time wagering lines, trending prop bets, win probability, and key player projections. Download the new Fox Sports app or visit www.foxsports.com. Hey, Undisputed listeners, it's Charlotte Wilder here to tell you about my new podcast with Mark Titus called The People Sports Podcast. It comes out every Thursday, and Mark and I take one of the big stories of the week, and then we go off on tangents you never saw coming. This might mean that we start talking about the Dodgers winning the World Series and end up wondering if Knicks fans deserve happiness or begin with LeBron's greatness and end up drafting our ultimate beer league softball team made up of old athletes. Whatever it is, the only rule of the show is that it has to be fun and funny because these days we can all use as many laughs as we can get. So check it out wherever you get your podcasts and come down weird sports rabbit holes with us. We can't wait to have you. So the Suns won 114-104 over the shorthanded Lakers last night, who were not only missing Anthony Davis, but also had to play without Marc Gasol and Kyle Kuzma. Despite LeBron dropping a game-high 38 points and Devin Booker being ejected midway through the third quarter, LA couldn't keep up with Phoenix and dropped its fifth game in the last seven tries. And with the win, the Suns actually leapfrogged the Lakers for second place in the Western Conference right now. So, Shannon, please give LeBron a letter grade for his performance last night. The objective here. Skip, Skip, I gave him a B plus. Um, I would have gave him an A had they won the ball game, but I thought he had it going. Did a great job of getting inside out, laying the ball up. He was attacking the rim, had some nice mid-range shots to turn around in the, from the lane, from the, uh, from the baseline. The three ball got going a little late, but I liked the way he tried to get guys involved. Skip, I thought he played as well. There's not a whole lot else he could do. He shot 66% from the floor, and it still wasn't enough. But I think what's happening is that some of his role players, KCP, because he's struggling offensively, it's affecting his defense. Wesley Matthews has been basically a bust with the exception of that one game against Milwaukee Skip, where I think he hit seven threes. I don't know if he's had more than one three in a game in the last 20, 25 ball games. With that being said, uh, the Lakers are going to have to make a decision. They are unwilling to guard the three-point line, Skip. And you can't keep losing. You can't be minus 12. You can't be minus 15, minus 20 from the three-point line and expect to win ball games. You can't trade a threes for twos. That's one point every time. And then because you're so, they shot, the Lakers shot the ball good from the floor, Skip. They were over 50% from the floor. But when you allow a team to shoot 55% from the three and the volume of threes in which they made, you're probably going to lose the game, even if you get a great performance from LeBron. And that's what happened last night. I think a lot of this falls on Frank Bogle. He's trying to experiment with lineups. You cannot have Wesley Matthews and Taylor Horton 
playing the same amount of minutes as Trez when Trez is really your only big. Because what happened, Skip, if you saw late in the third and through the fourth, they went Sarich at the five and had Chris Paul and a bunch of small guys. And what happened? Sarich was punishing Dudley down low. He waited too long to get Morris back in the ball game. And then they, they blew in assi- a couple of assignments and guys, Cam Johnson, uh, and guys were getting wide open threes. And I don't know what it is. Jay Crowder can hit threes for everybody else except when he played with LeBron in Cleveland. Skip, you saw him in Utah. You saw him in Miami last year. You see him in Phoenix. He couldn't buy a basket when he was with Cleveland. And that's why they traded him. But back to the original point, I gave LeBron a B, a B plus uh, to play without Gasol, to play without Kuz. I don't really know what else you could want him to do. He did everything that you skipped better and says, I want you to attack. He attacked. I want you to play out of the post. He played out of the post. He did everything he possibly could except win the game. I gave him a B plus, but the Lakers are going to have to get some better shooting and some better defending on the perimeter. <clears throat> okay, first point of order and contention here is I-, I thought the Lakers were the number one team in the NBA in defensive efficiency. Now you're telling me they can't guard the three-point line? I don't get it. Skip, you see it. You, you, saw, you saw last night, hmm. and you saw nights before that, and you saw the night before that. You see them. Teams hitting 20. What did Utah, how many threes did Utah hit? Well, they how do many that. did uh, they do Phoenix hit last night? Yep. Okay. So, but you got to guard the three. So you have now uh, acknowledged they're an overrated defensive team at number one in defensive efficiency, and I do agree with that. Now, back to Jenny's question. What letter grade does LeBron deserve for his effort last night? I'm, I'm going to be nice to him. I'm going to give him a D, as in disappointing, because I was so disappointed in LeBron James last night, especially after the 7-10 mark of the third quarter. What happened at that point? If we could see this, we could see what happened. LeBron drove, Aiton fouled him. I thought Aiton did foul him if we could see this. And it led to an ejection of Devin Booker. Here we go. And we got Devin Booker. And he said one thing to one ref. He bounced the ball to the other ref and said something else. And that was the end. It was bang, bang, tax. And the best player on a Phoenix Suns team that you have not had great respect for was gone with 7-10 left in the third quarter. At that point, the Phoenix Suns were up seven points, and I immediately tweeted, wow, it's LeBron's game on a silver platter. He should take this home at home. And he was not able to okay. do that. And the the Again, the Achilles heel for LeBron this year has been the three-point line. He continues to shoot and miss from the three-point line. And all the way down to the four-minute mark of the fourth quarter, LeBron was 0 for from three. He was 0 for four at that point. And finally, when they were basically hopelessly out of the game, if we could see what started happening... LeBron started hitting threes when the game was virtually decided. He made his first one. It was actually 4.03 left. He finally makes this one. That cut the lead to 10. Then at the 2.53 mark left in the game, he makes his second three, and that cut it all the way down to 11, the lead of the Phoenix Suns. 2.06 left, he makes his third three, and that cut the lead down to eight. Here we go. That's eight. And ironically, he actually has one with 133 left. That could have cut it. That, that was the, that we're seeing the review. This is the one that, that could have cut yeah, that the lead down to five and at least made it sort of semi-interesting over the last 133. And he missed it. So the one that really mattered, he missed. But, but here's what happened. It was so the what, classic what, 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 almost empty. Almost no, 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 I'm going. It's my turn. Sorry. This is the classic, (laughs) just all-time LeBron empty (coughs) calorie game because he scores nine quick points in a two-minute stretch from four minutes left down to two minutes left by hitting three inconsequential three-point shots that pad his totals from 29 points all the way up to 38. And it sounds like, wow, LeBron got 38 last night. Well, did they matter? 
No, they didn't matter because Devin Booker was out of the game and he couldn't seize control of the game, take it over from a team that didn't even make the playoffs last year and, and say, not in my house. He played 38 minutes. He I, played I all that. the way down the stretch to the end of the game. And they lost by 10 at home to a team that virtually for a, what the last quarter and a half did not have Devin Booker. Well, that's a big old D as in I, I disappointing for LeBron James. But hold on. <clears throat> so what are we going to do? <clears throat> Excuse me. What are we going to do about them guarding the three? So that's LeBron. So LeBron got to guard. Not only must, <clears throat> excuse me, not only must LeBron score all the points, but he must guard all five players. Because Dre Crowder, what did he do in the third and fourth quarter making threes? What about Sarich? What about Cam Johnson? What about Chris Paul? So what are we going to do about that? See, when everything, all you do is that when they win, you talk about this guy bailed him out, KCP and all this. But when they lose, he get all the blame, but you don't give him any of the credit. Because you always say, oh, this guy bailed him out. That guy bailed him out. But when they lose, you don't say other guys did not perform well. You say this is all LeBron. Okay, so even though you take away those nine points that he got in the third, in the fourth quarter with those three, 29 points isn't good? So, no. that, so that was a bad game. No, even though he's looking at the percentage he, in which he shot. He keeps jacking up threes, and he was 0 for 4 at that point, And they're just costly possessions in a close game. I think he's a lousy three-point shooter. He's a career 34% three-point shooter. I told you he would fall back to the mean, and it's a mean 34%, and that's where he's about to fall. He's at 35% now after all that hullabaloo about how he, was, he perfected the three-point shot. He was 42% from three. Baloney. He's he's not, he's not good enough to do that, but he's he's figured out if I can make some threes, it's it's easier, quicker path to catch Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for the all-time leading score. Well, that's hurting the team's ability to win home games, and they're losing way too many home games without Anthony Davis. Skip it, doesn't skip home road. It doesn't matter. A loss is a loss, and I'm looking at it. LeBron was the only guy that was plus of guys that played at least 20 minutes. He was one of the few guys that had a plus rating. Look at uh, minus kick 16 for Mars, minus 15 for Trez, minus 11 for uh, KCP, minus 11 for Schroeder. Skip, you watching KCP. KCP is struggling with his shot. And the shots that he's shooting are not even close to going in from three. And Wesley Matthews, those shots are not even close from going in from the three. But that's LeBron's fault. LeBron throws a perfect pass, hits him right in the pocket. KCP is missing layups, point blank layups. And it's hurting his defense because KCP is a better defender than what he's put on tape and what he's put in the game over the last month of the season. But because he's struggling, and you see him every time, what's he doing? He's chirping with the officials. He's getting in these hard fouls, and they end up calling a flagrant on him last night. I didn't think it was a flagrant. thought it was a just hard, common foul. But Skip, to say LeBron deserved a D, if you want to say, you know what, he lost. But if you notice... This is a lineup. I don't know how much you watch Phoenix, but they love playing Sarich at the five because it spaces the floor and not Chris Paul can work, either get to the basket or drive and kick. And if you look at the Lakers, what teams have given them trouble? Teams that have guards that can break you down off the dribble. Bradley Beal, Russell Westbrook. You see what Jamal Murray did. You saw Chris Paul. Guys that have guards that can take people off the dribble because the help's got to come. And when the help comes, kick to the corner, uncontested three, bam. And that's what we we'll see happening. So guys are going to have to do a better job of locking in, doing their responsibility, keeping the ball in front of them, and not having to rely so much on help. Uh, as to your point about how much I watch Phoenix, I will bet you I've watched them a lot more than you have because I like them a lot more you than have. you like them. And I know all about yes. Dario Saric because he is a basketball player. All he does is make good, sound basketball plays and shots. And he, he was great on the Sixers. He was a great complimentary player. And he really helps the Suns team. And you have to acknowledge him you have to honor him from the three-point line and it looked like LeBron had him I never 
can't tell who LeBron actually is guarding because he roams so much. But a number of those times, LeBron, who is still rated number one in defensive win shares, looked like he wasn't getting to the three-point line. Which brings me to my final point here. I'm only reacting with my grade to what you told me yesterday. You told me yesterday LeBron is still the leading MVP front runner. That's what you told me yesterday. Yeah. And that he is still the best player on the planet. So I've got to grade him on yeah. a little higher, more severe curve than I would Dennis Schroeder, as we call him, Kevin, Kyrie you don't, you, Schroeder. You don't that's what you call him. He was there last night. He was okay. You don't right? grade Kevin. You don't grade Kevin. You don't grade. You don't grade. You don't. You don't grade Kevin Durant on a high curve. Yeah, you I don't do. grade Kevin Durant on a high curve when they lose. No, you don't. No, oh, you do. don't. No, you don't. No, you talk about Kyrie and how Kyrie is interrupting the chemistry. You do not grade. Ky you do not grade other great players. But I did see my best big man last night. I saw what Yoke did and held for a stretch there in the game last night. I thought Sarich was Jokic. The way he was housing, because what did they do, Skip? They found a mismatch with Dudley. And bless Dudley Hart, he does try. He gives you everything he got. But what he had last night was not enough to slow down Sarich. And they got bucket after bucket or foul after foul. And then Frank Vogel finally realized, okay, I've seen enough. Let me get Mar uh, uh, Keith Morris back in the ballgame. But it was too late then, Skip. And also another thing, Skip, I'm surprised LeBron didn't start the fourth. Because you knowing that he's not going to play tonight, I would have said, hey, empty the tank. Empty the tank right here, bro. You off until the All-Star game. Give me everything you got. Well, he, he still scored 38. I'm sorry. He scored 38 points in 38 minutes, right? He played 38 minutes. I don't know if mm -hmm. you, you want to play 40 minutes. I wanted to play 42 because he might have got 46 and we might have would have won. Really? You lost <laughs> well, by 10. Well, Shannon, uh, you mentioned emptying the tank, That's so you okay. set me up perfectly for this. We got the grades out of the way for LeBron, but like you said, he is going to miss his first game of the season tonight as the Lakers play the Kings in their final matchup before the All-Star break. LeBron has said all season that he doesn't get tired, which is evidenced by the fact that he's currently played the fourth most minutes in the NBA this year. But now he'll get a little rest ahead of the All-Star game Sunday in Atlanta. So, Shannon, how concerned are you about the minutes LeBron has played the first half of the season right now? I'm not really concerned. I'm looking at my notes, Skip, and he's, I'm, I'm really not concerned because Le, uh, LeBron is, is 20, 30 minutes at 34.6, but he's in fourth in total minutes. So he's at the, basically the same point he was last year at this time, 34.6 minutes a game. It just seems, Skip, when you start doing overtime and double overtime, and all of a sudden what you would normally play is, say, 35 minutes, and you go double overtime and you play both of those, 35 is all of a sudden 45. And if you play, uh, uh, you know, you play 35, 36 minutes in a normal game, you go overtime. Now that's over 40. I think those are some of the things that have caused his minutes to increase. But I, LeBron does a great job of turning it on and turning it off. Like I said, he's like these new economy cars. You pull up to a stoplight skip and the car, <clears throat> the car truck automatically cuts itself off to preserve itself. And I believe that's what LeBron James is doing. He's done a great job of that. But for him... I'm shocked that LeBron James has played every single game up until this point because I would have bet a little sum of money that he would have missed at least five games by now. And he's missed none. This will be his first game that he's missed. So am I surprised that he hasn't missed more games? Yes. But it just goes to a testament because I think LeBron knows better than anybody. He knows he's closer to the end than the beginning. And he only has so many more opportunities, like you said, the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is a real thing. And the more you play 12 minutes, 12 points here, 18 there, Skip, that adds up. And LeBron knows that he needs to go ahead because you don't know, Skip, when the engine is, you know, you got 300,000 miles on a car and it's running good. And then one day the thing won't crank. And when you, once you do get it cranked, you go point A and then it shuts down again. So LeBron is going to try to maximize all these opportunities while he still feels that he's at his apex. Because you know eventually, Skip, it's going to come to an end, and he wants to make sure he's already past Kareem when it does happen. Okay. So if you'll recall, before the season started, the king was on the shop.
And the king, LeBron James, said to his man, Maverick Carter, I'm going to cherry pick X number of games over the first month or two of the season because obviously they had forced LeBron yes. into the shortest offseason in NBA history following the championship they won in the bubble last summer, right? When it's, no, it was in the fall. I'm losing track. The point is mm -hmm. that I... I heard LeBron, but I did not believe LeBron, and I sat right in this chair and I told you, I'm calling baloney on that because of the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar record that's out there for him to break. He does know the clock is ticking. He knows that he needs to seize every opportunity to, for, for a personal longevity achievement, Mark, that he can, it, it, it's, it's doable. As you, as you said, it, it's, it's realistic that if he can keep playing nearly every game, he can catch Kareem. And that would be the final big feather in cap that he could say, aha, that proves it, I'm the GOAT. It won't prove it to me because it's just a longevity record because he played longer than anybody else, especially Michael Jordan. But the point is, after he said that, I, I kept waiting for him to at least take one night off. He took no nights off until the final game of the first half of the season. So we're exactly 36 games into the season so far. They're going to play 72. And the final game is tonight at Sacramento. And he finally said, OK, I'll miss that game. And it is shocking to me. It's, it's actually, from your perspective and the Lakers' perspective, horrifying that LeBron has played the fourth most minutes in the league. And remember, he's only four minutes shy of third place, Fred Van Vliet. He's only 11 minutes shy of Jokic, who is second overall in minutes played. He's not going to be able to catch Julius Randle, who's plus 71 on him right now. He just seems like he's playing every minute of every Knicks game. But the point is— for two games. Yep. Yeah, the point is that LeBron hasn't cherry-picked any games. He's played every game to date, and he's piled up a lot of points. And he'll play some games to the close, to the, to the final buzzer, and I'll say, well, why, what are you doing? Well, he's stat padding, and I, I can't condemn him because it's glaringly obvious the goal is not so much to win games right now, it's to catch Kareem. If you can win championships along the way, that's great too. But the primary goal for LeBron James to me is to catch Kareem. And God bless him, he is Iron Man. He's been the, absolutely, he, he has been the healthiest superstar athlete in, in all my years of covering sports. Nobody has been the Iron Man that LeBron has been. But at some point, Father Time is going to tap him on the shoulder. And at some point, I'm going to knock on wood because I don't even like to bring this up, something pulls. He had the groin pull two years ago. But, but that's few and far between. But he's so playing a dangerous game asking, in the second half of the season. If you don't mind me asking, why does Father Time going to always tap somebody else on the shoulder but he won't tap Tom Brady on the shoulder? Well, he doesn't play basketball. So is Tom right? Brady stat padding? No, but I'm just saying, it's no he's championship padding. padding. Because all these yards, That's what he's not? doing. He's Super Bowl padding. Hold on, did LeBron, hold on, did LeBron James not win the championship last year? Yeah, it was. Is it a foregone conclusion that he's not going to win the championship this year? Well, they're not going to be in the bubble, so he's not going to have the bubble to his advantage this year. He, he Obviously, well, he it, took it, full it, advantage well, well, of I, a bubble championship. I told you it was made of cubic zirconia. The thing that we, Skip, the problem that I have with you and others, is that the thing that you commended Michael and the thing that you commended Larry and Magic is that they played on a nightly basis and they played a boat of load of minutes and nobody ever mentioned, you never mentioned, Mike was stat padding, Larry was stat padding, Kareem was stat padding. You said they have an obligation, they make a king's ransom, they go out there and play. It's only LeBron that's stat padding. It's only LeBron that's chasing Kareem. So, so what were the other guys doing? So why were these other guys, why was Michael Jordan playing 82 games a season, 38 minutes a night? I need you to tell me why. Okay, well, you obviously know that Michael was forced to take a couple of years off right in the middle of that, so he was much no, no, fresher no, 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 just, than LeBron, No, I'm talking about right? the night year. No, no, I, no, 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 no. I'm asking you, why was Michael Jordan playing 30, uh, 82 games a season, 38 to 39 minutes, and fought tooth and nail to come back from a broken foot 
even though the doctor says this is not a good idea. I need you to explain to me why. He loved the game. LeBron doesn't love the game. LeBron loves that. That's what you painted. So Michael and all these other greats love the game. But LeBron doesn't love the game. He just cares about stats. Really? Did, did Michael even come close to Kareem's record? No, because he didn't play enough seasons. No, he, he effectively retired okay, after skill. 1998 season, which was that last dance season that the documentary detailed in Chicago. Skill, skill. After, then he took three more years off high? before those two ceremonial years in Washington at the end of his career. Can I ask you a question, Skip? How is that LeBron's fault? The guys have not taken care of themselves as well as he has. The guys were, look, guys were blessed with other things. God blessed with Steph Curry the ability to shoot the ball better than LeBron from the three, from the perimeter, from the free throw line. But he did not give him the help that he gave LeBron. So everybody has something. But how is that LeBron's fault that Michael Jordan didn't take care of himself, that he did not train and he did not maximize what God had given him like LeBron? You fault LeBron for Michael Jordan not taking care of himself and him not being able to play 18, 19 years. That's not LeBron's fault. Okay, but would you agree that there have been times lately when LeBron looked tired even though he says, I don't get tired? Even you have said, boy, he looks like he's running out of gas. Don't I hear that from you? Yeah, I would have skipped, and I said this, I would love to see him. I know this is a flat, fast turnaround, 71 days from championship to the start of another season. I understand that. But LeBron says, I'm fine. He says, this is why I pay all that money. This is the way I train the way I train, the way, the, uh, why I eat the way I eat, to give me maximum effort. So when I'm on the court, I can give it everything I got. When I'm off the court, he says, I'm getting my sleep. I'm getting my rest. I'm getting my recovery. I'm seeing my people that I pay an enormous sum of money to to make sure my body responds when I call on it. It's not LeBron's fault. Got it, it skip, and it has a lot to do with not knowing. Guys didn't know each generation gets better, a better understanding of what he and she should do in order to, to maximize their time in their said field. LeBron James is just up to Annie. Tom Brady up to Annie, and you see more guys embracing Tom. The training, the year-round training, the way he eats, the way he prepares, and you see a lot of other guys, and you're going to see a lot of other guys adopt LeBron James' principle with the way they take care of themselves. Skip, it's a lot of money to be made. And guys are saying, I'm not going out. I'm going to drive this car until the wheels literally fall off. But I'm not going to let you hold LeBron to a standard you didn't hold the other guys. The other guys played 82 games, 38 minutes a night. But LeBron James plays averaging 35 minutes, and he's stat padding. Okay, nah, but I, I can't get down. With that. Help me out again. What year is LeBron in in pro basketball? What is it? 18. 18. 18 years. Can At you some tell? point. If I, let me ask you a question. If, let me ask you a question. If I didn't tell you, if you didn't know LeBron James was 36, if you didn't know he was a year 18, you look at his numbers, what year would you think he's in? I agree. He, he's having the greatest 18th year anybody's ever had because at the bottom line, he's number one in defensive win shares. What? That's, that's what's outrageously great about this year for LeBron. Despite all of his poor shooting from three and from the free throw line, he's number one in defensive win shares. You can't be that guy unless you're playing your tail off on both ends of the court. He's trying to catch Kareem on one end, and he's leading the league in defensive win shares on the other end. Well, that's a lot to ask of a guy in year 18, and Father Time is going to get a little anxious here, get a little impatient with LeBron, and he's going to tap him on the shoulder at some point, and I don't want to see it happen, and I'm talking about tapping him as in, be careful of that hamstring, be careful of that groin, be careful of... What, whatever well, it muscle pull like, it might be. It almost be. seems like that's what you're wishing for. I'm not. Because I've never heard you say Father... No, no, but I've never heard you say Father Time is going to tap Tom Brady in maybe a knee or maybe an ankle or maybe a shoulder. I've never heard you say that, and Tom Brady is 21 years, about to go to 22. Uh, Tom Brady is about to have knee surgery, which is going to keep him out for most of the offseason. So it, it already he, he's tapping him. 
He tapped him last year. They said Tom Brady was annoyed no, by was the it. whole year. It bothered him the whole year because he had torn cartilage that needs to get fixed. No mercy. Well, we got to see more of the new laid-back Tom Brady last night, joking with James Corden about his now infamous Lombardi Trophy toss. But it seems like Brady is still keeping Bill Belichick's no days off mantra going in Tampa. Bucks QB coach Clyde Christensen said the 43-year-old QB called him just hours after the postgame party to not only thank him for his work this season, but also to look ahead to the future, saying, quote, I think we can really be better next year. Shannon, what was your reaction when you heard this story? Well, considering Tom Brady, I don't think retirement was ever a topic of conversation for Tom. I'm not surprised that he was anxious to get back and get started again. Um, knowing that uh, they just won the Super Bowl. And Tom, <clears throat> Tom is like, this is not a one-time thing. I do not believe this is a one-time thing. I believe not only can we get back, we can be better in the process of getting back and doing this thing all over again. I'm also not surprised that Cl Tom, uh, Clyde Christensen told this to the St. Petersburg Times. I think that's the, or the Tampa uh, Tribune or whichever paper it was. I'm not surprised, which would further the narrative that Tom Brady, no days off. Oh, Tom Brady, all he cares about is yada, yada, yada. I, I, Skip Bayless always tells me, why does LeBron, why does everybody got to make Le, LeBron everything that he does so public? I ask that very question. Why does everything, that, now when Tom was doing this, Tom had a famous saying, when they asked Tom, Tom, what's your favorite ring? He would say, the next one. That was about it. Now everything that he says off camera, off from a live mic, somehow gets back in the media because it pains him as, oh, my goodness. Skip, this is ridiculous. Clyde Christensen could have kept this to himself. But what it does, it furthers the narrative of Tom Brady, <clears throat> excuse me, Tom Brady and this and yada, yada, yada. Tom is great. Nobody's trying to refute that. But this notion that every waking hour, every waking minute is about football is not true. So, Shannon Sharp, it sounds like Tom Brady continues to haunt and torment you even through the offseason. Am I right about that? Yeah, but it's just not so much him. It's just that this, this love affair and everything that he does somehow makes it back to the media when the first 20 years we never heard anything like this. Okay. Obviously, Tom Brady no longer plays for Bill Belichick. Obviously, the Patriot Way is now in Tampa Bay, but it has a whole new set of rules where everybody have fun. That's the biggest rule. Under BA, as in Bruce Arians, everybody talks, everybody laughs, everybody posts. It's not the, the way it was under Belichick's iron-fisted rule in New England. And to the victor go the spoils. So all these coaches, all these players are making the rounds. Obviously, Brady did James Corden last night. He's making the talk show, the late night chat show rounds. And he was talking about heaving the, the, the trophy from boat to boat and how he found out later if, if that had been muffed and fallen in the water that the, the Hillsborough River was 80 feet deep at that point and it would have sunk to the bottom of the river. And I have no doubt that Gronk would have deep dived after it and come up with, with, <laughs> without even using any oxygen tank. But the point is, Brady was having fun with it, talking about how his what is she, eight-year-old daughter was saying, no, daddy, no, and she was the only voice of reason. Okay, to the victor go the spoils. Every time I look up these yes. last couple of weeks, it sounds like Clyde Christensen is doing another interview. I barely knew who he was before it came clear, <laughs> oh, he's the quarterback coach of Tom Brady because obviously Byron Leftwich is the coordinator and Bruce Arians is sort of the Correct. architect of the mm -hmm. offense and the great Tom Moore is the overseeing advisor of the offense. So now we go all the way down to, oh, the quarterback coach is, Todd, is uh, Clyde Christensen. And who knew? And so people are talking to Clyde because he's close to Brady. Well, there have been a couple of points where he's done interviews where I, I winced and I thought, did Brady really want that to become public? Because he's, he's just like blurting everything out <laughs> that, that Tom ever says to Clyde Christensen. Well, 
Okay. Yeah. There's no harm Especially in what he said about the Peyton Manning situation. Okay, but but I thought it was kind of cool. Oh, I, you're I talking think, about the Peyton Manning situation. Yeah, about the Peyton Manning. That's correct. And in yeah. this case, I I did think, you know, sue me if you want to, but I thought it was pretty cool that Brady woke up after like two hours of sleep and thought. <clears throat> I, I never even saw Clyde last night. I, I didn't tell him thank you because Brady's big on thanking his coaches because that's the way he was raised. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to condemn that. I don't think it's phony baloney. I, I think he really thought I, I never so, hugged Clyde last night. I never said a word to him. So he FaceTimes him and says, hey, thanks for all you did. It was a great run we had. But, but, but hey, I've been thinking about it. I think we can be better next year. What did Brady say before the Super Bowl in one of those Zoom interviews that he did the, you know, yes. the week before? He said, I think we can be better. And we did that topic here. I, I agree. Right? And I do believe that he and believes with all his heart and soul they can be better just on continuity, just on repetition, because they got thrown together right. last year on the fly. They didn't get A.B. until they were 6-2. and two. And surely, if they can keep the bulk of the team, 95% of the team together, yeah, just on repetition, they're going to be a little bit better next year. So I, I don't have a big problem with this. And it sounds like Clyde Christensen is enjoying his 15 minutes of fame. Yeah, I, I agree, Skip. But if you remember Peyton Manning, his first year in Denver, they went from eight and eight and uh, winning the division and went to thirteen and three, and then they lost in the divisional round. And then Peyton came back the next year and threw fifty-five touchdowns with over fifty-four hundred yards, and then they went to the Super Bowl, although they lost. And then they followed that up again and go went back uh, uh, a couple of years later. So I do believe this offense can get better. Um, but I just it, it's just um, all of a sudden Clyde Christensen. It looked like he's trying to talk himself into a head coaching well, job he because he's doing more interviews to be, than B.A. and Byron Leftwich. And by the way, <laughs> given the way this league is trending right now, I would give him a better <laughs> shot at getting a head coaching job than Eric Bieniemy. How about that? Hell, he, he might get a head coaching job before Byron Leftwich. <laughs> he and he's a, he the quarterback's coach, and Byron Leftwich called a play. I wouldn't be surprised if he got the job. Because remember, Skip, if I'm not mistaken, he was also on that staff in, in Indy. He was. With Peyton. Yep. If I'm not mistaken. No, he's been around for a so long like, time, man, but I nobody knows Peyton. who he is until <laughs> yeah. now. Well, way to go. They do, they, they do, they do, they do that. But, Skip, for me, I'm surprised Brady even slept. Because I don't even remember sleeping uh, uh, after winning the Super Bowl. Because your emotions are so high, even after you've done it three times, even the first time, I definitely didn't sleep. But even after the next two, Skip, you still like it. Like, man, and we did this thing again. Yep. Again, I mean, so I'm surprised he even dozed off for two hours. I'm, <clears throat> and considering how he was at the parade, Skip, I don't know. He might have been passed out. I don't know if that's dozing off. He might have been, been having such a great time at the party. Giselle had to drag him. Her and the bodyguards had, probably had to drag him back to the room. Okay. I agree with all of the above. But in the end, I'm highly amused by the fact that Tom Brady does continue to torment you and drive you crazy even weeks after the Super Bowl no, is over. No, Skip, you, my thing is, is that I want you to hold him to the same standard that you hold LeBron. It annoys you that LeBron posts. It annoys you that things leaks out of his camp. That bothers you, but seemingly nothing Tom Brady does bothers you. That's all. It, it doesn't annoy me. Hell, I want, somebody to, I want somebody to knock Tom Brady off the pedestal. I don't want him to walk away and give up his crown, to give up his castle. Somebody need to beat him, continuously beat him, so he says, you know what? I can't get back. I can't win it. I don't want him to walk away. I don't want, I don't want him to walk away because like Jordan. Because, see, when Jordan walked away, people actually believed he could have won eight in a row. Yep. Well, if Tom walks away, people are like, man, he could have won nine. He could have won eight, nine. Who knows? He might have won ten. So, no, I want someone to beat Tom and make him go away. I don't want him to walk away. No, I want him to stay. Hmm. And if you can't beat him, but you can't beat him. But I don't want Tom Brady to walk away. Well, Shannon, I will say this in conclusion. At least Tom Brady doesn't do post-game interviews without his shirt on like a certain king did the other night a couple of games back. Remember that? Well, yeah, if, if Tom Brady took his shirt off, people throw up. <laughs> no, you can't do that, Skip. That's not everything. It's not for everybody. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Look, 
You would not. There, there, grow there's up. levels to this. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that. If you don't want to have your shirt, it's fine. No, I, no one's upset about that. I, I'm not upset over here. No mercy. Pro Football Focus ranks the Cowboys as the third most likely to improve in 2021. While the article points out ways Dallas can shore up its defense through the draft and free agency, it makes no bones about the fact that Dak Prescott's return is the major reason for hope for this team. According to their metrics, Dak was the third most valuable QB in the entire league last year for the five games he played. So his comeback will make Dallas the clear-cut favorites in the NFC East. So, Shannon, hmm, do you agree? Hell no. Skip, <laughs> since you and I started this show way back in September, right after Labor Day in September of 2016, Pro Football Focus and Pro Football Analytics and all these other stats have come out and said the Cowboys are the most talented, one of the top three talented teams in all the NFL. And this should be the year they're poised to make a deep playoff run. And every year, my good friend Skip Bayless gets disappointed. Now, at some point in time, we're going to have to start and, and, and make a, and improve to what? <clears throat> Skip, what's the standard now? I remember your team used to be judged by championships. And now, now improvement is how they're judged. Let that sink in. America's team, the most valuable sports team in all the world, are judged by improvements, not championships, not an NFC title game. Improvement? And they say, well, Dad got, okay, Dad got hurt last year. The other 24 years that you have not reached the NFC title game, and the other 24 years in which you've never won more than two playoff games. What happened then? Skip, your guys, you, you, your money is tied up in a lot of big names, the guys that haven't lived up to the financial obligation that Jerry gave them. You look at your big dog, like you said, that gets this franchise tag, six, seven players eating up 75% of your cap. You can't win like that. You guys have underachieved, but at some point in time, Skip, we got to stop saying this is one of the most talented teams and they're po poised for a deep run. A deep run to what? Mm. So instead of being 4-12 and 12 this year, what? You're hoping for 8-8? Eight and eight? You're hoping for 9-7? I mean, what, what, what's it? I, I need more pro, uh, pro football focus. Tell me the Dallas Cowboys are going to be soup. Because when I look at this, are the Cowboys better than the Bucks, Packers, Rams? Right now. No, so only the Cowboys get to improve and then they can make a deep run. So what about the 49ers? They get their health back. What about Seattle, the Saints? Miss me with the Cowboys. The Cowboys, only a name only Skip, but even, you know what? Eventually, even Skip Bayless is going to hop off this train once he sees it's not going anywhere. Shannon Sharp, that sound you just heard was me <laughs> hopping off the train. For once, you got me. You have backed me up against the wall. You have taken me to school, to the cleaners. You, you have taken my soul on this topic because, yeah, a year ago, I was bullish on my Dallas Cowboys. They had added all these free agents on defense. They had like 10 free agent signees. And I thought... They've got to be better on defense, and they're going to be great on offense with Dak and three receivers who could all go over 1,000 yards. And an offensive line that I thought with Ty Smith and Zach Martin and no, 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 no. Hurt, 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 hurt. So I have gone officially from bullish to looking at my team as a whole bunch of bull dinky. It's a bunch of bull dinky. I, I cannot see it because I am doomed and damned with the Dak Prescott impasse, contractual stalemate. Yes. There, there's no win here for me. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. I'm with you. I'm pretty sure it's going to be damned if you do where you go ahead and tag him. So that's 38 million bucks you're going to pay him. That will count 21% of the salary cap. Then, as I detailed a little bit for you earlier, DeMarcus Lawrence next year will count 12% of the cap. <sighs> then here we go down the list. Zeke will count 7%. 
And Amari counts 10%, Zach Martin, 8%, Ty Smith, 7%. I'll add all those guys up, Lyle Collins and Jalen Smith. They add up to a grand total of 55%, and that's only six more players. So to your point that you just reiterated, seven players will cost, <laughs> will count 76% of my salary cap. And how are you going to fix the defense that ranked 28th in points allowed and 31st in rush yards allowed. 28th in points, 31st in rush yards. They were pathetic. For half the year, two-thirds of the year, they were historically bad trying to stop the run. And Shannon, yes. all of a sudden, look at all the free agents on defense. Maybe this is a good thing, but, but here's some of the free agents on defense that they will not be able to keep. Ty Crawford, Sean Lee, Awuzie. Jordan Lewis, Xavier Woods, Antoine Woods, Joe Thomas. These are all, some are pretty decent players on a bad defense. Yeah. Well, again, right. it, it's so bad right now that if you give, the, if you put the tag on Dak, it feels like you're going to have to play with 10 players on defense. You, you can't play with 11 because they won't be able to pay 11 players. Maybe you get away with playing 10 or right. 9 players on defense because you can't afford the other two. And again, you, you got the 10th overall pick in the draft. Pro Football Focus says it's Caleb Farley out of Virginia Tech. I, I haven't watched him enough. That cornerback, they, they say he's just extraordinarily gifted. I have watched Patrick Sertan. That's the way I would go. Tried and true. His father was a, yeah. a very good player. So whatever. So you get the, yeah. the, the other cornerback opposite Trevon Diggs, who was a little bit of a revelation. He was great and bad, but, but he was mm -hmm. often very good. And He can be really good. He, he can be. But, you know, you still have Randy Gregory. But then I didn't even mention Alden Smith. Are you going to be able to afford him? Because he was a revelation. He was a godsend last year. I told yeah. you in the offseason, I thought yeah. after five years out of football, I thought he could play. Our, our man Jay Glazer said, yeah. trust me, he can play. He's been a monster in the weight room. And he was often a monster on the field. He was very, I'm not saying he was great, but he was very good. Well, he's a free agent. Can they afford him? I, I don't know how to even keep Alden Smith. So, so Shannon, wh where is it heading? How much better can the defense be with another rookie at corner and a second-year player at corner? I, it, it can't be much better. And if, if, Dak, I, I, and I, yeah, if, if Dak is tagged, there's bad blood between Dak and Jerry that, that trickles down into the locker room where it doesn't yeah. feel right. Mm -hmm. It feels like, you know, Dak's making a lot of money, but, but he's not happy. He, he knows he might be one and done more. You know, this might be the end of the line. One more year in Dallas, and he's hitting the free agent market. Well, how can I sell that? Right. And, Shannon, how can I sell that Ty Smith and Zach Martin are going to bounce back and live up to their deals? They have huge deals. You know, eight years, 80, uh, 98 million, six years, 84 million. They, they count huge against the cap. Well, they're, they're only 30 years old, both of them, but, but will they be healthy next year? I doubt it because, 30. yeah, it, they, they, their history would tell you they won't be able to stay healthy. Ty played two games last year. Zach made it through 10, but he missed six big games and obviously missed down the stretch. I, I can't sell it. I can't see it. I, I can't feel it anymore. It, it feels doomed to me, and it starts with the impasse between owner and quarterback that has gone into that bad blood realm where it just doesn't feel right, and I can't figure a way to fix it because I don't think Jerry is going to go into that close to Patrick Mahomes realm to make Dak happy because I think he sees that he overpaid too many other players at a much less level and that, that he can't risk getting stuck with an overpaid quarterback the way the Eagles and Rams did with the top quarterbacks in that DAC draft. So you, you got me, Shannon. Well, the problem, the, the problem that he has, Skip, is that the guys that he paid, the offensive line, they played really well. But, Skip, they got a lot of collisions on those bodies. Ty Smith and Zach Martin, Skip, they ran the ball. They were as good as advertised. I believe probably both of those guys are going to end up in Canton. But what has happened is that the other guys that he paid the money to hadn't fulfilled the obligation. 
Zeke hasn't lived up to no. 15 million. No. Ty Law, uh, Ty Law, Demarcus Lawrence has not even come close to making the Pro Agreed. Bowl. Agreed. Jalen Smith has not been that no. guy since he got the big deal. No. Amari Cooper, Amari Cooper has the highest paid receiver skill, and you got to go probably nine, ten receivers before I would take Amari Cooper. So I agree. while you got Dak could pop wants 40 million, the guys that you've already paid are not living up to what you thought they would be. Yep. So there is your problem. You, 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 you're talking about a problem that you might have with Dak. Well, he might not live up to that. Well, you already know the guys that you paid on defense aren't living up to those contracts. And the offensive line that you gave the money to, they did. But, Skip, you know once they start going into your back as an offensive lineman, you're not going to be the same. And Ty Smith, what? He played two games last year. He missed five or six the year before that. He did. Three or four the year before he that. He did. You start seeing these injuries start coming with greater regularity, and they start keeping him down for longer periods of time. Okay. So they got the work cut out for him. So, Shannon, Pro Football Focus says number one likeliest to improve next year is Cincinnati. Will Joe Burrow's back healthy? Sure, I could see that. Number two is, is Jacksonville. They only won three games, Gil. Yeah, I got it. But Jacksonville, you got Trevor Lawrence, you got Urban Meyer coming in, you got tons of cap room. You, you, you have some good pieces already left. And, yeah, I get that. They should be much better next year. Then we get to Dallas. They're basing the whole argument on Dak being back in the saddle. Well, I continue to tell you, he's six and eleven in his last seventeen <laughs> starts. And even if we look at just this past year, early on, he played well against the Rams in the opener, but they barely lost. But then he didn't play very well at Seattle. And at home they fell behind twenty nine to fifteen at halftime to Atlanta. And you always tell me, Well, didn't you guys have the ball some? Yep, we had the ball, but it didn't yeah. they couldn't catch. <laughs> and then at home against Cleveland. They're behind 40 to 14 going to the fourth quarter. Well, yeah, we had the ball too, and I can't defend it. And then against the Giants in the game, Dak got hurt. He fell behind 17 to three to the Giants at Jerry World. So I, I can't sell it that, that he's a world beater, that he's a top two quarterback in the league, and here we go. No, here we go south. Skip, let me think for just a second. Pro football. Gene, let me, let me say this, Skip. Skip, All pro right. football focus say team that make the best improvement. They got you in the category with Cincinnati and Jacksonville. <laughs> That's true. That's Skip, a good you're point. the Dallas Cowboys. Touche. And they got you with Cincinnati and Jacksonville. Touche. I actually have well thought said. Of it that way. That's a good point, Shannon. That's a good point. I just am curious if this will be a good season for Skip, for his Cowboys, a stressful no. one. I, no. I, I, I just no. don't know what to expect from no. you, Skip. I don't know what's going to happen with No, it's going to be um, terrible. <laughs> and I'm going to love it. Yeah. I'll be right here for it. Love it. No mercy. So James Harden will make his return to Houston tonight for the first time since he forced his way out via trade earlier this season. And, yeah, that was a little messy. But Harden hopes to get some love on his return, saying, quote, the love and the appreciation that I've given to that city and that I still give to that city, I'm hoping that the favor can be returned. Interesting to think about, Shannon. If you are a Rockets fan, how would you react to Harden's return here? I would be upset because he quit on my team. Um, there's no other way around that. James Harden is a, has been a great uh, player for that organization. And when he's uh, introduced, I would cheer because I would realize, and I think he'll have a greater appreciation skip as time passes. But in the meantime, I'm still a little upset. Upset. So when they introduce him at the start of the game, I'm going to cheer him. But every time he touches the ball after that, I'm booing the brakes off him because he doesn't play for the Rockets anymore. He plays for the he plays for the Nets. So I'm going to boo him, but I'm going to get I'm going to cheer. I'm going to cheer for the time, the great moments that we had that he had while he was here. Uh, and it's mentioned that uh, I think for Tita, Tillman for Tita, uh, says he's going to retire the number, and he should skip. I think James Harden is probably what the second best. I think Elijah Wan is the best player in Rockets history. And then you can make a toss-up between he and Moses Malone for second best. But I think Elijah Wan is hand down for me the best player. Won two championships, defensive player of the year. Many times, I think it was a nine-time first-team All-NBA. I believe he, he arguably the greatest defensive center. Some will say Bill Russell. So James Harden, for what he's done in that organization, for what he's done for the city of Houston, Skip, he's deserving of having his number retired. He should be uh, uh, cheered in the beginning. They introduce him, James Harden, Arizona State. Yay! 
He get the ball in his hand. Boo! So, Shannon, I'm, yeah. I'm with you about the jersey. It, it deserves to hang in the rafters. I'd also throw Clyde Drexler in there as one of the greats. You, you could argue yeah. him somewhere up in yeah. the pantheon. Clyde only played. He didn't play. He only no. played a couple of years. He didn't play yeah. ball that, but, that but long. He, but yeah, he was a great player. Yeah. They they love him because he played at the University of Houston, obviously. The University on of Houston. Five yeah. Slamma Jamma team. Yeah. North Carolina yep. State got him. But the point is, where where you lost me a little bit was. You're going to cheer him when he's introduced, but then you're going to boo him when he touches the ball. Maybe yeah. I can't relate or identify with a Rockets fan, but <laughs> I, I don't think I could, I could flip that switch. I don't think so. I think if I'm going to boo, I'm going to boo when he's introduced. And they have every re reason to boo him because he quit his way right out of town in one of the ugliest it episodes is. in the history of the National Basketball Association. And he went from Fat James to flipping his switch in Brooklyn, and all of a sudden Fat James was playing at an MVP <laughs> level. And you can make a very strong case that he deserves the MVP as we speak, that he is edged ahead uh -huh. with his phenomenal triple-double the other night in which he had zero turnovers. Mm -hmm. Well, where, where was that early this year? Well, obviously there was method to the madness. He just won it out. So we gave him one good he opening salvo, as we, you and I talked about, at Portland. And then after that, he's just not going to play because he wants out and he right. successfully forced his way not only out, but into basketball heaven with KD and Kyrie in Brooklyn. And you see the results now. And unfortunately, Rocket fans are having to live with the results. So that would hurt my heart if what I were What about the eight and a half fan. years, Skip? What's that? What about the eight and a half years that he did? What about the eight and a half years? Okay. I mean, you just can't look at the bad times. And sometimes, you know. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give you this. These are the reasons that you should forgive and forget if you're a Rockets fan. He won you an MVP. Three times he yeah. led this league in scoring, and they were three in a row. And he also led the league one year in assists in 2017. And he established right. himself, yeah. as I think we both agree, simply the greatest perimeter scorer in the history of the league. And you got to benefit yeah. from that as far as being entertained by that on a nightly basis. You got to root for that. But come postseason, you, you had more pain than Definitely. joy because James' overall record in Houston in the, po in the playoffs was 42 and 43. As you know, they twice got to the conference finals against Golden State. The first yeah. time they lost to Golden State in five, and in the closeout game, James really was the disappearing act, APB. And then you remember what happened in 2018. They lost in seven, but they were up three games to two when Chris Paul again pulled hamstring, and it was up to James to try right. to carry the load, and they lost game six by 27 at Golden State, and then they lost at home in game seven by nine, and once again, James was a virtual no-show, and we've seen him be no-shows against my Spurs and big playoff closeout games, so he, yeah. he, he never delivered at the biggest moments in playoff games. So at least that disqualifies him enough that if I'm a Rockets fan and I watched him quit his way out of town, I, I don't think I could applaud him when he's introduced tonight. If, if anything, I would just sit on my hands. If anything, I'd just be quiet. Maybe, <laughs> maybe silence would be the most deafening. You know, if, if, it would just, if they gave him the silent treatment tonight during introductions, maybe that would hurt the most. But to your point, I don't doubt that they're going to boo him and boo him louder and louder the more he touches <laughs> the ball, and he will have the ball in his hands a lot. Yeah, Skip, but I look at it like this, and Jenny, you can appreciate this. Skip, you're in a relationship five, six, 10, 15 years, and it doesn't end the way we all hope, hope we would live happily ever after. So are we going to discount because it ended badly? We're going to discount all the good times that we had? 
I was like, well, damn, didn't we go to Super Bowls and didn't we go to the Kentucky Derby? Didn't we have a good time? We went out to eat and had family gatherings and got together. So you're just going to discount every good that we had and only focus on the bad? So the Rockets fans, are you only going to focus on the last, you know, nine, ten games in which he quit? I, Skip, I'm not, I'm not excusing his behavior. I don't want people to think, so you, it's okay to quit? No, it's not okay to quit. He handled it poorly. James Harden will tell you he handled it poorly. But I'm saying, he gave you eight really good years in the last, you know, month, two, three months were, were bad. So the bad, so the, I guess now they're saying the three months of bad outweighs the eight month of good. That's my only thing. I'm like, and, and that, you see that a lot in the relationship, Skip, is that people discount all the good that's been, that's been built up and just focus on the negativity or the bad. I'm not like that. Okay, but Shannon, to further your relationship analogy, what if in the bitter end <laughs> she cheats on you and then she runs off with the other guy? I, I don't think you're going to be able to forgive and forget that one. I, I, I don't think you're going to cherish the good times. I think they're all disqualified. Yeah, yeah Skip, you have to. No, no, Skip, Skip, you can never, without forgiveness, there can be no freedom. <laughs> so no, I okay. can't let her hold I, my I got feelings it, but in the end, in your heart of I hearts. Can't, I can't let I can't be in bondage. Because, yes, give me, it, it'd be a bad situation. But, you know, you have to move on. Hey, she's better. She This is what she wanted. That's not how we wanted it to end. I'm sure the Rockets fan didn't want it to end like this. Because you're never going to get value back for James Harden. Skip, they're not getting another James Harden. No. They're not. No. Those guys, those guys don't come along. Guys like James Harden come along once every 15, 20, 30 years. And the Rockets are not going to get him. Get well, another one like that. Yeah, look at them now. They're, they're tail spinning, man. They, they're, <laughs> they're having a hard time. Well, they lose, they, I think they lost 11 straight. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking about 4,500 fans who will be in attendance. And Shannon, since you brought me into this conversation with the relationship analogy, I'm not cheering for him. I don't want to see him happy that he's moved on to a new relationship. It's working Damn, great. He got Jenny. really fit. Without me? No, no, no. I, I'm not cheering for him. I, I would not be going to that. Jenny, y'all had great times together. It does. What about all matter. those ski trips? What about all those vacations? No mercy. Sunday, the best season ever, continues in Las Vegas as the NASCAR Cup Series looks to put on a show in Sin City. The action heats up at 3.30 Eastern on Fox and anywhere on the Fox Sports app. So listen up, there is good news and bad news coming out of the latest DAC contract talks. This according to NFL Network's Jane Slater. The good news, the negotiations between the team and Prescott have been more productive as of late. The bad news for Cowboys fans, apparently Dak wants to be paid, quote, right behind Patrick Mahomes, who, yes, remember, signed a 10-year, $500 million extension last summer. While Dallas feels their offer is, quote, respectable, they're clearly, they're not in that ballpark. Yet. So, Shannon, is Dak worth close to Mahomes' money here? Yeah, we, we have to be careful saying what a guy's worth because when you... And, and, you know, the casual fan is going to say, hell no, because you have teachers and people that are more important than a football player not making nearly that amount of money. And so that's the public sentiment, Skip. But you and, you and I both know guys are rarely paid what they're worth. You don't base it on what a guy's worth. You pay the market and the market keeps creep, creeping up because this is what we know. Who's coming up down the pipeline this year, Skip? Josh Allen, uh, Lamar Jackson. What do you think they're going to get? Do you think they're going to get more or less than $40 million per year, Skip, when they sign their deals? I feel very comfortable in saying both of those guys will be north of $40 million. Dak is saying Deshaun Watson signed a deal with basically three to four years left at $39 million. He says, I'm willing to give you guys a discount for some long-term security. Skip, this is a, a, a conversation that Jerry and Dak should have had two years ago. And you could have gotten for the number closer to what you wanted to pay as opposed to now. So now you can't say, man, man, I, I know I should have bought that house or I know I should have bought this because the value has increased. And that's what it is, Skip. You know how this thing works. Value of players increase from year to year. And so it's better to and coach, give Coach Belichick this credit, Skip. He normally goes to guys early. Give them big money, and you're like, wow, that's big money. And we looked in two years, 
Grunk went from being the highest paid to in two years, he was like fifth or sixth. But that's what you do. You overpay early and then you get the bargain. You let a guy play his contract out and he's not going to give you a discount, Skip, because he felt he, he will have felt you forced him in a situation that you were betting against him. Jerry Jones bet against Dak Prescott for three straight years. And now after betting against him and Dak knows he bet against him, hey, homeboy, how about giving me a discount? Dak said, nah, I'm not going to be able to do that. Okay, Shannon. I, I get all the points you're making, but I have to gauge and judge this, rank this right here, right now. Back to the question. Okay. Is Dak Prescott worth a deal that could average, say, $44 million a year over the next four years, close to Patrick Mahomes' money? The resounding mm -hmm. answer is no, 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 no. I love Dak Prescott. I have defended him more than anybody, but I love my team even more, my Dallas Cowboys. And that could wreck their cap for the next four, five, six years if he can't live up to that, and I'm not sure he can. I've told you from the start, I, I love the young man, but I never said he was the best quarterback or the second best or even the third best quarterback. I've ranked him as high as 10th. And yet, if we look hard at what's happened, I'm all for players getting all they can get. But what was realistic was on the table going back two seasons ago. I'm going to remind you, Jerry Jones said after game number one two years ago, after they beat the Giants at home in their opener at Jerry World, it is imminent, that was the quote, imminent that we are going to sign a long-term deal with Dak Prescott. What does imminent mean? It means within hours, maybe a couple of days. And Shannon, you know and I know what happened. They let it bleed into the next week, and Dak yeah. had another big game, that one at Washington. Then they, it bled into the next week, and he had another big home game against the then woeful Miami Dolphins. Shannon Sharp, the Hall of Famer, said no, no, no at that point. All three were, to quote you, garbage teams. So it's basically garbage stats that you're putting up against garbage teams. Yet, that's when Dak and new agent jerked rug out from under Jerry Jones and said, guess what? We've decided April Fool's in September, Jerry, we want a whole lot more money. And that's when they started talking about north of 40 million. And at that point, Jerry had offered somewhere around 35-ish, 36-ish, which even Shannon Sharp said, yeah, that's a realistic, that's a fair offer from Jerry Jones. But once you jerk rug out from underneath that guy in a negotiation, you got problems because his pride is bigger than, than his brain because his brain should say, well, let's give a little bit here. Let's get this done at, at whatever cost it is now so we don't have to pay later. But Jerry's pride is so huge when it comes to what, what he does best, negotiating, that, that if, you, if you go back on a handshake deal, which is what they did, you are doomed with him in a negotiation because his pride is going to get dug in deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's where we are now. And it feels like, the longer Dak plays, the, the higher that salary goes. And so, no, he's not worth it because, Shannon, I'm, I'm going to remind you one more time. That year, after those first three games, they played 13 more. You gave Dak seven Fs, as in flunk, as in failed, in seven games. Do I have to remind he you of the games? Him. Give them to him. Do, do, but, again, you said he earned them. And the games were, yeah. long-time Cowboy fans will know painfully exactly what I'm talking about, at New Orleans, at Jets, remember at Chicago on that Thursday night, remember yeah. at I Bill do. Belichick and Tom Brady in the cold, remember at Philly for all the marbles at the end of the year, remember Buffalo on Thanksgiving oh, yeah. Day on that big stage. Yep. Dak did not play well in any like of yesterday. those games, Shannon. And he was graded by Pro Football Focus over the last 13 games. He was graded the 14th best quarterback in Pro Football. So he's middle of the road. Well, I, I can't defend that because you know what was happening to me? Everybody said, Dak bet on himself. 
Well, he did. He was betting on himself in those last 13 games two years ago. And guess what happened? He crumbled under the pressure. Well, what if you give him an average of 44 million? He gets what, what he held out for, what he stuck, stuck in for, what he demanded. It, well, do you think he mm-hmm. can live up to it? I, I don't know, Shannon. I can't trust it. If you could promise me that Dak would go win a Super Bowl in the next couple of years, I'd say good. Well done. Well, well paid. Worth every penny. But he can't do it by himself. And if you're going to pay him that much money, you're not going to be able to fix the defense or the offensive line. And I say good luck, Dak Prescott. Well, but here's the thing, Skip. Of the guys that finished, you said he was 14th, the pro football focus graded him at 14th. Yep. Were the 13 other guys up for contract extensions? No, because, if they, because here's the thing, Skip. You let a guy get to the end of his contract, he's less likely to give you a discount and see what has transpired. Every time somebody doesn't give you a discount, what do you do? You automatically hearken back to Tom Brady. And that's what I've said. Tom Brady has been a blessing and a curse because he's helped New England with their salary cap, and now the expectations around the league is is that everybody should help in order to win Super Bowls. But you haven't shown the ability to field a team like Coach Belichick. And you do not, so I'm not giving you the discount because I don't trust you. In a quarterback situation, it's the only position that if you bet on yourself, you don't have to have a statistically great season. You just have to be healthy when the season's over. Okay. Dak Prescott, even though he suffered that broken ankle, they said he's ahead of schedule yeah, as far fine. as rehab. I, I have no problem with that. I have no issue there. I'm with you. But it gonna cost you forty million. Okay, but here you say, here Eight. comes Josh Allen, here comes Lamar Jackson. Do I really believe yeah. that Dak is better than those two younger players? I don't. He's very good, but I don't think he's better than those you, two. Hold up. I, I, now, hold on. Now, all of a sudden, now, you don't believe Dak is better than Josh Allen. Well, over the last three years, you said Dak was better than Josh Allen. Now, it comes to Dak about to get some money. Now, Josh Allen is better than Dak. No, I haven't said that. We never talked about that. We never did them yeah. head-to-head. Yeah, yeah. Mm-mm. No, we put them in a pool. And I said, who you like, Dak? You like this guy? You like that guy? You took Dak over everybody, except Deshaun, except Patrick Mahomes. You like them more than Josh Allen. You like them more than this one. No, now I, Dak about to get this part no, of two Shannon, million. I, last time we ranked quarterbacks, Pain. I think I ranked Dak 10th. But that was going back a ways, and, and I can't Pain. argue against what Josh Allen did last year. Did he not come on strong okay. down the stretch last year? I didn't love the way he played in the playoff yeah, let game. Yeah, but, but again, over the last eight games last year after they got Hale murrayed was he not outstanding? Yeah. Was he not let me ask a, you a, a top ten quarterback? Do you, ever hear the, do you ever hear the Pagulas? You ever hear them giving press conferences? You ever hear them on the radio? You ever hear them doing uh, uh, interviews? Do you hear them talking before the game? Of course not. If Jerry Jones would sit his butt down and let the people that he hired do their job, you'd probably go a lot further. But since he want to be front and center, he wants to be face of the organization, and therein lies the problem. You okay. pay a quarterback that kind of money, he's the face, and Jerry wants to remain the face of the franchise. No mercy. LeBron will miss his first game of the season tonight as the Lakers play the Kings in their final matchup before the All-Star break. LeBron has said all season that he doesn't get tired, which is evidenced by the fact that he's currently played the fourth most minutes in the NBA this year. But now we'll get a little rest ahead of the All-Star game Sunday in Atlanta. We're now joined by Fox Sports NBA analyst Chris Broussard. Chris, good morning. Uh, How concerned are you about the minutes LeBron has played the first half of the season here. Not at all, Jen. Not at (laughs) all. And and first, for those that might say, oh, LeBron, a week ago, he was talking about punching the clock, and this is hypocritical. We all know LeBron's been an Iron Man throughout his career, but he's only played all 82 games one time. One time. So he's always taken a strategic game off here or there, a lot of times at the end of the season. So this is nothing really to be concerned about if you're a Laker fan. But as far as the minutes, I'm not concerned because, one, I haven't seen a drop in play. All right, he's playing well. We know last night he had 38 points. 
I get it, some of them came late when he hit those three-pointers, but he played well. He was a plus two, the only starter for the Lakers who had a positive plus minus. Lately as well, you see his defensive effort has been pretty strong. So I don't see any decline in LeBron's play where I would think, oh, these minutes are having taken their toll on him. Secondly, he's only averaging 34.6 minutes per game. That's the same as last year. And those are both career lows from last year and this year. So LeBron is not overextending himself. And this is not unprecedented, you know, because Michael Jordan and Skip, you've said this before. When Michael Jordan was 39 turning 40, he played all 82 games, 37 minutes a night. Carl Malone at 39 played 36 minutes a night. Kobe Bryant in his 17th year played 38 minutes a night. So this is not unprecedented. And two of his last four games, LeBron's been under 30 minutes. And then finally, if you, and Shannon, you brought this up last week or early in the week, LeBron's been off the ball a lot lately. Like last night, same thing, off the ball, which I I like because it's making these other guys create. But what that means is the minutes he is playing are a lot less taxing both physically and mentally. Like when he has the ball all the time and he's got to create 90% of the Lakers offense for himself and his teammates, that is taxing on the brain and the body. Now you see he's taking a lot of threes, he's off the ball, and his three-point percentage is only a few games, but it's actually gone up 44% over the last three games. He's obviously playing pretty well. So I actually think that that is making these minutes not be as hard for him as well. So I'm not concerned in the least bit. I agree with you, Chris, because I think nobody puts as much time, energy, and effort into their body and to maximize it with the way he eats, the sleep, the physio, the training, all that that's necessary to still play at an elite level. He's basically 26, 8, and 8, which is not bad for a guy in year 18 at 36 years of age. 26, 8, and 8. I'm going to, I'd love to see some guys when they get to year 18 and 36 years of age average those kinds of numbers because we've never seen anybody average those kinds of numbers this late in their, their career. And I agree with Schroeder taking more of the load of handling the ball because if you notice, Skip, LeBron is not bringing the ball up anymore. It's Schroeder. He's playing a lot more off the ball. And LeBron is, I use the analogy of Chris, LeBron is one of these new age cars. You pull it to the stoplight, you don't go somewhere after like two, three seconds, the car shuts off. So I'm preserving myself because I ain't putting this extra wear and tear on me. And that's what LeBron is doing by being off the ball. But when he needs to be explosive, and you saw this last night, he still can get to the rim. He still can finish at the rim. He still can get whatever he wants. He can post on the, uh, on the wing and put the high post and still initiate offense. So I'm not concerned. A lot of these minutes, the 34, just imagine, uh, Chris, if they hadn't gone to overtime and double overtime in four of the last eight games, he would probably be somewhere around 31, 32 minutes a night. But because of the 50-plus minutes, the four, I think he played 46 one game, 43, 41, that increased into 34 and a half, which is still the second fewest minutes like last year what he played. I'm not concerned about Goat James. We go take tonight off, take Thursday off, Take Friday, do a little shoot around, go win this thing, because that's what we do since we've been the captain last three years. We win it, and then we're going to have some more time off. But we'll be ready. When we come out the break, you're in trouble. What's ahead is caught. What's behind stays behind. That's our motto. Hmm. So my turn, and I'm about to call baloney on the king and on my man, Mm -hmm. Shannon Sharp. Because the King said before the season started on the shop to his man, Maverick Carter, oh, I'm going to cherry pick a whole bunch of games early this season. And I called baloney then. I said he will not miss a game. Shannon Sharp said, oh, he will. It's the shortest turnaround in the history of the NBA from championship to start of season. Okay, show me. Well, he didn't show me because he played in every game all the way until tonight's final game of the first half of the season. LeBron played and don't give me average minutes. Give me total minutes on that body in the 18th season. Give me the fact that he is fourth in the league in minutes played and wait, 
He's only four minutes behind third place Fred Van Fleet, and he's only 11 minutes behind Jokic, who is second in minutes played. So don't bring me average. Don't bring me career lows, 34.6. Bring me total. Bring me how many games did he sit to help his team in the second half of the season? None. And I'm calling baloney on the motivation here because clearly LeBron is playing to catch and pass Kareem Abdul-Jabbar scoring the most points in the history of this league because that's all he's got left to make his case that he is the GOAT above Michael Jeffrey Jordan. So don't, it, it's all about catching Kareem and I believe he's put a personal goal slightly ahead of a team goal because this is a dangerous pace that he's on going into the second half of year 18 at age 36. And Shannon says, well, Jordan played all 82. Yeah, he played all 82 seven times out of his first 13 seasons. He also had an 81 and an 80. But he only really played 13 seasons that counted and mattered. He took two off in the middle of that, forced in, in his Chicago run. And then because he, his coach was run out of town, he said, okay, I retire. And he stayed retired for three years and came back for two ceremonial years in Washington that didn't matter and shouldn't count to me because it, he was just playing because he could play because he was Jordan. So in the end, yeah, I, I'm going to knock on wood for LeBron over the second half of the season for his team because I think there's a lot of new wear and tear on that great body of his. He's the most durable superstar I have ever closely observed. But at some point, Father Time will tap him on the shoulder and say, uh, you've stat padded too much through the first half of this season. You played way too many games that didn't really oh matter, goodness. too many fourth <laughs> quarters that were blowouts just to pad your Kareem catching stats. And something, I'm going to knock on wood, something might pull. Chris, well, can I ask you a question, all, Skip, Chris? Let's talk you about this game. Uh, Chris, go ahead, Shannon. Chris, let me, I, I wanna, Chris, I want to ask you this. Chris, you've covered the game, you say, for a quarter century. Have you ever heard somebody criticize any of the all-time greats for playing in the games like LeBron James get criticized? So when Jordan was playing 82 games, because before Kareem had the Wilt record, Wilt Chamberlain had the record. So was Michael Jordan trying to catch, catch Wilt when he was playing all 82 games, Skip? Because that seems to be your reoccurring theme. LeBron James plays 82 games. He's stat padding. Jordan, Bird, Magic, Kareem, all the other historically great players play 82 games. We commended them. Now we, out, now we ostracize LeBron for wanting to play? He has an ulterior motive for wanting to play? But all the other greats got kudos. They got flowers. They were commended for playing 82 games. LeBron James is the only guy that's cast, that's, that's, that's that's looked down on, frowned upon because he wants to play. It's always an ulterior motive for LeBron. Nobody else had an ulterior motive. They played because they loved the game. LeBron played because he wants to stat pad. Wow. I, I, I agree. I, I mean, look, guys, and, and remember a year ago, two years ago, we were criticizing the stars for sitting out nationally televised games. A lot of the Lakers games are on national TV. And LeBron is playing in those games as well. Skip, we talked about the minutes with Jordan, Kobe, Carl Malone. Even back then, and it wasn't that long ago with a guy like Kobe. Even back then, the nutrition, the training, it still wasn't what it is today. And so LeBron is getting the benefit. We see the same thing with Tom Brady. Guys take better care of their bodies because of technology. So if they could play those minutes years ago, Jordan, two decades ago, then LeBron, I believe, can handle these minutes today. And here's the other thing. I'm not blaming him for trying to break Kareem's record. I, every great player He's from so Michael close. Jordan to Magic, Kareem, all of they all have individual goals. That's what makes them so great. I don't think he's putting that above winning the championship. But you can do both. I don't need You can do both. And I, I, God bless him for going out there and trying to become the all-time leading scorer. That's a worthy goal. Michael Jordan wanted to be the absolute greatest. And I'm not going to criticize LeBron for wanting to be the absolute greatest. Uh, time out. Michael Jordan had one sole goal to win championships 
and he went 6-0 and in the finals with six MVPs. Case closed. Phony goat is LeBron no, see, James. See, that, All that, you got that's are a individual that's a different accolades to based on longevity. No, no, one, skip. Two. skip. Exactly. Skip. That's a different argument. We're not arguing the GOAT. You're looking down, you're blaming LeBron for wanting to play when you heap praise on Jordan for playing every night. When all these other great players played, you like, oh my goodness. But LeBron was sitting out in Cleveland. You was complaining. Michael Jordan did this. Kobe Bryant did that. And this one did this. Now he's playing. Oh, he's being selfish. The only thing he cares about is Kareem. Why can't he win a title and get Kareem's record? Okay. Oh, they're not mutually exclusive. You can do both. Just don't bring me what you've brought me over the last two or three weeks, which is, boy, LeBron, he just ran out of gas last night. I don't want to hear it anymore. No mercy. The NBA officially announced its contestants for next weekend's All-Star festivities. The three-point contest is full of stars like Steph Curry, Devin Booker, and Donovan Mitchell. But the dunk contest is lacking name recognition as rumored participants, Zion Williamson, will be notably absent. As previously reported, the league will stick with a three-man field of Anthony Simons, Cassius Stanley, and Obi Toppin. In the dunk contest, a trio certainly lacking the star power Zion could have provided here. So, Shannon, what does this tell you? Skip, the league has morphed into a shooting league, and the best players are not leapers anymore. The Kevin Durant, the Steph Curry, the Bradley Beals, all those, the Devin Bookers, they're not leapers, they're shooters. Uh, Skip, you remember the great players in the league from the Connie Hawkins to the Dr. J's, the Michael Jordan, the Dominique Wilkins, they were extreme leapers. And the dunk contest was fun to watch then. Now, Skip, they got a guy, Anthony Simons. He has two dunks. Cassius Stanley has spent the majority of his time in the G League. And then Obi Toppin. Really? Zion Williamson, although he's built like a Mack truck, he's a Ferrari. You don't drive a Ferrari every day, Skip. You put like 5, 10, you put like 15, 20 miles on the weekend, and you put it up. And Zion's like, hold on, I'm trying to rest this body. I am not putting, you got to practice these dunks, Skip. That's more wear and tear on your body. So I'm not surprised uh, Zion is not in it. Skip, they just need to go ahead and do away with it. Because what's the dunk that they can show us that we haven't seen? You remember, Skip, I'm going to let you go. You remember the quarterback used to have the quarterback challenge? Yeah. And all the quarterbacks, the great quarterbacks used to show up, the Marinos, the Elways, yeah. the Aikmans, and then all of a sudden they stopped showing up and the second-tier quarterback started showing up. They did away with it. Now we're getting second- and third-tier dunkers. Just do away with it. Find another way. Brain, let the WNBA star women compete in something. But the dunk contest is a thing of the past. Shannon, I am so with you on this. I used to live for the slam dunk contest <laughs> back in the day when Dr. J did yep. it a couple of times. Michael did in it the ABA. three times. Yeah, and remember, Dominique, the human highlight film, he yes. did it five times. But in those days, they yes. just showed up and dunked. Whatever came into their head, they just dunked. There were no skits. There, yep. there were, were no, you know, SNL sort of stunts with it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> here came Dwight <laughs> Howard. A whole lot of Remember, Dwight did it four times, but Dwight it kept going yeah. up and up and up with skits and stunts to the point that it, it's like, can you top this? They got too good for their own good. And too many yes. dunks take too much out of you. And it, it's now too to many the missed point. Dunks, Skip. What's that? Too many missed skills. Yeah, miss I can't yeah. give you a 10 if you miss your first and two, no. three opportunities and you still get a 10. How? Okay, I got it. So now I live for the three-point contest because it's star-studded because you. they don't need a skit. Yes. They don't need a prop. They don't need a stunt. They just shoot. And it's nope. no different than what they you do shoot. in practice. You just shoot threes. And it's no right. huge deal. Right. It doesn't take that much out of them. And so they're all lining up to do it just like usual. So I can't wait for that. And I'm with you. It's to the point maybe we should do away with it. And yet I, I did see a dunk on the Internet yesterday that Cassius Stanley pulled off a dunk, if we could see it real quickly. The problem with Cassius, this, this was a hellacious great dunk. I couldn't even figure out how he did it. If we could see this, he lobs it to himself, and then he goes around the back, maybe between the legs, and dunks it left-handed. The problem is 
Cassius he, Stanley now plays for the Fort Wayne Mad Ants. Really? Uh, yes. Where have you gone, Blake Griffin? <laughs> Kobe did it once. Vince did it great. You know, like, where, where right. have you gone? Well, well nobody's going to do it anymore. And unfortunately, it, it started with LeBron, and I'm not condemning him for this, but LeBron just said, I don't want to do that. I'm a power dunker. I'm not a skit dunker. Right. Create, creative. Because think about it, Skip. What do we see all the guys do before the, before the game? They're shooting threes. They're shooting logo threes. They're shooting yeah. half court threes. Nobody's dunking anymore. Nope. It used to be guys showed up and dunked in the pregame in the line, layup line. Now all guys don't do is shoot threes. It's evolved from that. <laughs> it I mean, it's really evolved. It's just not the same. Uh, it's not the dunk contest from before. No mercy. The Steelers are committed to Big Ben coming back for another year, but they're reportedly ready to move on from wide receiver Juju Smith-Schuster. So Schuster got more attention for his TikTok videos this season than his play on the field. And the former second round pick out of USC never became the true number one receiver they really hoped could replace Antonio Brown. So Shannon, I know how you feel about the TikToks, but how surprised were you when you heard this? Look like Corvette, Corvette going to be moving on, Skip. I'm not surprised by this. And anybody that knows football, that played the game of football, know Juju was nothing but a glorified two. He got that attention. He, he got those numbers because A.B., all the attention went to A.B. And now when he got the coverage rolled to him, he got the number one receiver. You saw, but Skip, this is the Steelers' M.O., San Antonio home, yep. Lexico Burris, uh, Emmanuel Sanders, Mike Wallace. Yep. They moved on. Only Hines Ward and A.B. got contracts after their rookie season. I'm not surprised by this. Okay, but it seems like yesterday Juju was voted by the team as their MVP for that year. But here we go with another mm -hmm. cap casualty because they've got Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool and, and obviously James Washington and Washington, Eric Ebron. James and they're Washington. just saying, okay, see you later. Those TikTok well, videos I'm not gonna are, are I'm not, not going to pay the well. I'm not going to pay the kind of money that Juju wants. All right, guys, that is it for undisputed. Great stuff from both of you. We're back same time tomorrow morning. The herd is on right now. Have a good day.